talk about the issues of race, inclusion, diversity, and social justice. I'm your host and moderator, Marie Younger Blackburn, and welcome to our show. Um, I'd like to start by introducing um, some of our uh, panelists, and I'm going to start with um, Jeannie, and she's up here in the corner, as you can see. Um, and she is uh, the co-founder of Sandwich Stands. It's an organization that started in response to the murder of George Floyd um, some months ago. And um, she and uh, her co-founder Mara, who you'll hear from later, they decided that there was something that they could do. So we're gonna hear from Jeannie and we're going to hear about the wonderful um, initiatives that she has been doing in the town of Sandwich. Welcome, Jeannie. Marie, thank you. Uh, this is a great opportunity to talk about something that Mara and I started initially thinking that it would be a one-time event. And it quickly became clear to us at the conclusion of that event that there was a need in Sandwich, a desire in Sandwich for continuing efforts, continuing conversation, continuing um, the work of putting the issue of racial justice um, into the public conversation space. So uh, you're right, we, we, we started this um, shortly after George Floyd. The country was a mess. Um, there were lots of riots and lots of protests. The police were being asked to do impossible, an impossible job in very difficult circumstances. And Black people across the country were hurting, hurting deeply. And, and we saw other communities doing things. And we, we um, Mara said, I wish Sandwich would do something. And I turned to her and I said, well, we're Sandwich. And so that started it. Our very first phone call was to Chief Wack, who, who was on the program today too. We wanted to know, you know what, what was um, going to be supported and what was going to be safe and what was going to be purposeful. And he was very, very helpful. We decided to do a 36 hour round the clock silent standing event. We thought that there was a lot of rancor and a lot of violence and a lot of hostility that people were quick to, to make snide comments on social media, but slow to step out and do something meaningful and really engage. And that's what we wanted. We wanted people to commit to coming for at least an hour. We wanted people to stand there and to bear witness to the sorrow and the, the horror that was being played out, not just in this present moment, but for hundreds of years to our communities and individuals of color across the country. Uh, we were kind of astounded. We, we, we thought by, by design, we wanted this to be a very inclusive kind of effort. We made sure to bill it as nonpartisan, nonpolitical. And uh, we did get pretty good community-wide support but um, we also got pretty good community-wide criticism. Um, people from the far left um, thought we weren't, our message wasn't progressive enough. And there's a lot of um, mean talk, quite frankly, on Facebook about us. People on the right criticized us for being anti-cop and uh, that was, that was kind of disheartening to, to see that in an effort to unify us, we were antagonizing you know, two different groups of people. Um, but nonetheless, at the conclusion of the event, um, people wanted to continue the work. And so Mara and I decided that, that what we wanted to do was to create a platform for people to continue to engage in a way that is civically meaningful and civil. 
So we have empowered other people with um, social justice issues, particularly issues around Black Lives Matter and, and, and uh, racial injustice. Uh, we can continue to have a group of people stand every Saturday for two hours all summer long, which um, is, is a big commitment to, to make that when other people are at the beach or out, you know, boating or fishing or whatever, uh, to have this kind of um, support, this ongoing, not going away kind of support to put this message out there. Uh, and now our, our, our new direction is, is going to be to, to continue this idea of bringing people together for exactly the kind of thing that you're doing here, Marie. Like we want people to engage and to be um, listening, right? To have, to have a space where they can share their stories and to share, uh, to share it in a way that um, has that personal lived experience. The big issues out there have become so politicized and so distant from how people walk through their lives and live the moments of their lives. I don't know what it's like to be a person of color. I don't know what it's like to be a cop, to carry a weapon, to be afraid. You know, I mean, I really don't, but I would like to learn and I feel that in learning, I'll have a far better understanding about the policies that we need and the kind of um, actions and policies that I personally want to support. Thank you so much. And we'll come back to you. Um, Jeannie is also a communications instructor at Cape Cod Community College. And um, Thank you for um, adding that. Um, we often ask the question on this show and on my other platform, let me tell you a story. Um, we ask, are you listening? And I think right now we are at um, a crossroads in our nation where people are, um, you know, there's a lot of discourse, but there's also a lot of work being done because of this um, time. And I just want to bring on our, our next guest, um, Chief Wack. Let me see, I got to change my view so that I can see everybody. Okay, Chief Peter Wack, he is the um, Chief of Police at um, in the town of Sandwich, Massachusetts. Um, it borders Barnstable and Mashpee. And we welcome you today, Chief Wack. We, um, yeah. Thank he you very much. He asked me to call him Peter, so I will, um, yes. for the purposes of uh, just respect to you. Um, you know, listening to one another, it's something that um, we have to, um, we're learning to do, right? We, um, in the wake of the, the George Floyd murder, um, the issue of, of race um, has become just real prevalent out there. And also the issue of policing. Um, in your career, have you ever seen anything like this or have you ever imagined that um, the issue of policing and race would come to a crossroads at, like this? You know, I, there've been different situations that have happened around the country, um, you know, very trying situations, but this is the first time in my career, a little over 30 years, where we've seen this large of a reaction. Um, and really, it's brought us to a point where we really need to come together even, uh, even closer on this topic to, to identify what solutions we need to be making. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see that you um, went to undergrad and you were studying biology and um, some environmental, <laughs> environmental biology. Environmental biologist, yes. Yeah. So, how did you end up um, with a career in law enforcement? Uh, long story short, uh, my college had a police department, and um, it intrigued me. I mm -hmm. was, uh, I was looking more to go into forestry, and uh, I started off doing a little bit of work with the security. And next thing I know, a few towns up in New Hampshire they run with part-time police officers. They hired me on and I worked my way through college doing police work. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think I just uh, really kind of caught the bug for law enforcement. 
and doing things for other people. And it led to Connecticut where I did 20 years with the Connecticut State Police before coming to Cape Cod. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, so yesterday, um, Peter and I did a um, discussion, a panel with Sandwich. It was um, sponsored by Sandwich Stands and the uh, newspaper. And we had a conversation on policing and race and, and we've come to know each other a little bit, had um, phone conversation and just did a little talking. And, you know, when we begin to talk to each other and listen to each other, we find out that we have more in common than we, um, we're more alike than we are, you know, um, different. And, you know, we, we find out that some of our values are the same and that um, the biases that we had have towards one another begin to melt away when we do have these conversations. I had one more question for Chief Wack before I move along and it came in from one of our um, viewers. I'm gonna try my best to um, interpret what she's saying, you know, reading what she's saying. Um, she is a sandwich resident. Um, she says, Chief, Chief, um, Chief, what is Blue Lives Matter? And back the blue accomplishing in response to Black Lives Matter and people having enough with the um, broken justice system? That's one part of the question. And don't you find it to be a lack of compassion to the plight of black and brown people? Another part of the question. And instead, why not put Black Lives Matter signs at the police station and sit and listen to black people and their message? Well, thank you for the question. It's a good one. So um, the Blue Lives Matter is a private organization, uh, group of citizens. It doesn't have anything to do with the police department. It's a group of citizens. A lot of them have attended um, our Citizen Police Academy, which we have a little over 300 graduates from. And during the time after George Floyd's you know, tragic death, and, and please let me emphasize it was tragic, it was wrong. And I have written about it uh, and spoken about it at great length sure. through the media. But um, this, this group saw that police were starting to um, be targeted, uh, even here in Cape Cod, uh, home addresses, people who had blue flags in their yards were being targeted, um, violence was being encouraged, and uh, they, they chose to come together as a support mechanism. Now, these groups have been around forever. Yarmouth has their police foundation, um, their Blue Jacket uh, group. We've had our Citizen Academy group around forever. So I, I believe these people just felt that they needed to do something and it was their choice to do on their own. I don't know a whole lot of in depth about what, um, what they're accomplishing from it or um, you know, what, what is gonna come from it, but you know, I do hear about it. Uh, I did go to one event where uh, Sergeant Sean Gannon, who we know who was tragically killed here on Cape Cod several years ago, his mother and father spoke about an initiative they have on scholarships, which are trying to provide to young adults that want to be police officers. So um, that that was that was interesting um, to listen to. As far as uh, the, the 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 division between Black Lives Matter and Back the Blue, um, one of my focuses is on not trying to go in either direction. My focus is on community development and, and outreach. Um, you know, it wasn't long ago we were dealing with issues with folks from the Middle East, Muslim Americans after 9-11. And then we were just recently dealing with sexual orientation challenges that were happening not only on the Cape, but uh, throughout the Commonwealth. So we're, we're in a new era and my focus is and has been, whether it's speaking yesterday with you uh, or on NPR news, which I've been on, is trying to communicate that uh, we're, we're looking for solutions and we have recommendations and ideas. And I've been speaking to a lot of elected officials about just that is how do we move forward from here in the right direction? Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, Chief. Um, feel free, our listening audience, to type any questions that you have for our panelists into the chat and we will, um, gladly read your questions for you. And if you have something that is pressing that you want to say, you could raise your hand and we can call on you. Um, at this time, I'd just like to thank our sponsors um, who are on, um, Kennedy Donovan. Um, I see Nicole Piera, who is the um, 
coordinator, she's here, and um, Maureen King from the Department of Developmental Services. I'd like to thank our sponsors. And again, social techie, Karen Ryan, who is on here as well. Um, at this time, I wanna bring on um, Kiara Gogan. And Kiara Gogan is the owner of Kiara, Kiara Gogan Life Coaching. Um, addition to her um, life coaching work, she provides training on inclusion and um, some anti-bias work as well. So I'd like to bring her on and give her a moment to talk about who she is and, and what she does. Uh, thanks, Marie. Um, yep, Kira Gogan. Um, I have a um, consulting uh, company that I that I started. I did start with one-on-one um, -on -one coaching, which I still do, um, but sort of quickly moved into, I was working with a lot of women um, and sort of everything sort of morphed into um, working with organizations on diversity, equity, and inclusion, doing a lot of, uh, I've been doing a lot of unconscious bias trainings, a lot of, you know, workshops around some of these topics, racial injustice, unconscious bias, um, women in the workplace, all sorts of different um, topics. And, and I really, you know, I really enjoy the work. And sometimes people ask me like, well, what, you know, they, they see this, you know, white girl. <laughs> doing this work around diversity, equity, and inclusion and wonder why. And I'll tell you a tiny bit about my background. I actually grew up in Ireland. So I'm an immigrant. I'm over 50. Um, I am uh, a gay woman. And so I, I kind of fall into all of these boxes of like potential discrimination, right? Obviously, you know, um, obviously I'm white, so I don't fall into the, you know, the black uh, sort of area of potential discrimination, but, but a lot of other factors and, and, and not to equate them, but just that's just sort of a tiny bit of background of why I'm interested in the work and why I care about this stuff. Um, and, and just on the, just trying to touch a little bit on the conversation that was just happening with, with Jeannie and, and P Peter, right, Peter. Um, I was in a conversation a couple of weeks ago with some folks and there was a guy whose uh, family is, um, he has a lot of um, police officers in his family. And then, you know, other people on the conversation were like, you know, well, well, you know, just this, all of the, the rancor that's going on right now between, you know, Black Lives Matter and Blue Lives Matter and all this sort of stuff. And I had a, I had a thought that um, to your point, Marie, about bringing people together and finding common ground, I think that there's a common ground in this, and, and there's more than this, but this is one that really struck me, is the mother, the mothers, the, the, the fear of mothers, right? So black women, their boys go out into the world, they fear for their lives, right? I think that's a fair statement uh, and, and their daughters and themselves, right? But there's, but there's a particular fear, I think, around black men going into the world, you know, driving, walking down the street, jogging, buying cigarettes, whatever, right? So there's that fear of, is my, is my child gonna come home? Mothers of police officers have the same fear for different reasons, but they have the same fear. They have this fear of, am I gonna see my child again when they go out the door? And so it's one place that maybe we can find some common ground to sort of come together and have a conversation around that. I mean, you know, obviously, like I said, the, the reasons for the fears are different, but the fears are the same and they're very real. And so it's just one area where I think there's a potential to kind of come together and have conversations. Mm -hmm. So that yeah. was just a thought I had on that, yeah. Conversations are good. And I think we're right in this country for conversations, but um, the, the stock reality as we are now, um, people aren't talking. We're seeing flags waving, banners raised, anger, um, people taking, sides, people taking each other's signs from one another. Um, let me see, someone's asking a question and they're asking, how do I, hold on, the question just kind of went away. How do I explain to someone that Black Lives Matter and Blue Lives Matter are not the same? Um, if you don't mind, I can, I can answer that at least from my perspective. I, I saw something recently that really kind of struck me. Um, black is a, uh, it's a person, right? You're as a person, you're a black person. You're that's part of your identity. It's who you are. It's how you were born. Mm -hmm. Blue is a vocation. Blue is a job. Mm -hmm. Black is your, is who you are. And, and I, I'm sure that 
Peter and other law enforcement officers would argue, but blue is who I am too, right? You are when you're, I think when you're in law enforcement, you are like, that's, you know, that's who you are. That's a big part of who you are, but it's not how you were born. And so I think there's a distinction there. Um, I don't know if that helps admire, but um, that there's a distinction there between it being part of who you are as a, as like literally part of your physiology versus it's your job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yes, and I think that's how it's been explained that um, there is no blue life, you know, right. in the vocation. Um, and Black people cannot take their their skin color off. We, mm -hmm. we can't, you know, change our race. Mm -hmm. And there's right. a, a difference. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, just the response. Um, I know that there's been a lot of pain and hurt over the response to Black Lives Matter the response being blue lives matter. It's almost like saying I hurt and someone saying I hurt more or I hurt too. I'm not hearing you and your pain and acknowledging your pain. Um, Kiara, I just wanna stay um, with you for a moment and just talk about um, the uh, vice president and the president's response um, the vice president said that um, there is no systemic racism, that he doesn't uh, believe that mm -hmm. there is any in his debate in the president. Um, and it, it went by so quickly that a lot of people may have missed his comments um, when he was asked about um, backing away from his um, anti-bias training on a federal level that he had sent you know, a memo to the Department of, um, I believe, Education asking them to get rid of those trainings because he didn't want people to be trained with language like, um, um, what's it, uh, you know, anti-racist messages mm -hmm. or um, messages of white privilege and et cetera, right. things that he called anti-American. Um, there's a you know, a, a little saying that I saw going around that said, America is so racist that to talk about racism is to be called racist, <laughs> right? So even having the conversation, when we have these conversations now, we take risk. I know I do. I feel like I take a risk every, every um, Wednesday that I log on that, you know, my, um, that I'm taking a stand on something. I am the moderator and the host to keep the conversation going. And um, it's just been very helpful on both ends just to get information, right? But to have these hard conversations sometimes can be misconstrued as being divisive or racist. Um, do you wanna to speak to that, Tara, and how that, how the changing of those um, trainings will trickle down into right. the workplace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, to, to, there's so much there. The, I mean, the idea that, the, that systemic racism doesn't exist and this is not a racist country is absurd, right? I mean, clearly the history of, you know, of slavery and then Jim Crow, redlining, um, you know, mass incarceration. I mean, all of those systems are racist. And and I, I remember I, somebody commented, Brene Brown commented one day saying that the system isn't broken. The system is working exactly as it was designed. The system was designed to keep black people down and raise white people up. And until we face that as a, as a nation and especially as a white, as the white, you know, sort of majority of in the country, we can't change what's happening. We can have conversations like this, you know, which, which are fantastic, but there has to be an acknowledgement of the fact that there is racism in this country. And for the president to try to curb progress really by saying we can't, any diversity training that uses the word, words white fragility or white, suprem uh, white supremacy or white privilege and anything that talks about anti-racism is not allowed, right? So initially my response to that is, I can't say it out loud on, on this forum because it's gonna be published. But also I, in some ways I thought, well, that doesn't impact me because I don't work with the federal government, but actually that's not necessarily true because any organization that I potentially work with that has federal contracts is in jeopardy if they 
if somehow this gets out that we're having this training and we're having these conversations. So it's really, um, it's another dog whistle. I mean, at this point, even calling, I mean, people talk about this all the time, right? The president's dog whistles to racists. They're not dog whistles anymore. They're just overt statements to say, you're my people. I support you and I don't support black and brown people. I mean, we've known that really, I feel like since the beginning of, of his, of his, you know, when he was running, but people don't, haven't seen it. It hasn't been as overt. It's certainly more overt now. The FBI has said that the biggest threat to this country is white supremacist groups. The biggest terrorist threat to the country is his own FBI. Well, our FBI, I should say, because he doesn't own them, but they're, white supremacists are a big threat. I mean, look at what happened in Michigan with that group that has decided to kidnap the, the governor. I mean, that, this is what is the end, the result of the things that he says and does and this administration, it's not just him that they say and do cause these things to happen. And so in order to be able to have a conversation, you know, talk about freedom of speech, we should be able to have open conversations about these things. I mean, systemic racism does exist. Of course it exists. And, and, it's, and it's the equity piece of diversity, equity, and inclusion is in some way trying to repair some of the damage, right? So equity means that not everybody, so if we assume that not everybody's on a level playing field because they're not, right? Different people have had different experiences, different education opportunities, different, op, you know, whatever they might be, fill in the blank, right? There's tons of different opportunities. If we have um, a level playing field, then it's not fair to it's not fair to the people who haven't had opportunities along the way, right? We have a mentality in this country about you know pull pull yourself up from your bootstraps. Anybody you can achieve anything. Look at LeBron James. Look at Oprah. Like like you know silly comparisons, right? But but the the reality is that if i have had disadvantage since my great great grandparents time i'm already behind and i i can never catch up unless somebody gives me a leg up like some that's what equity means equity means i'm going to give you some extra help to get to where to get so you have the opportunity to be where everybody else is and have the same opportunities as everybody else because that just doesn't exist but if the president and the administration says you can't talk about this stuff in trainings then nothing can change you know we mm -hmm. have to be able to have those conversations and have them openly sure thank you sure thank you, Sarah. i'll come back to you i just wanted to take a moment and acknowledge a couple of people who are here on the call i wanted to acknowledge Gret gretchen um you can unmute yourself and say your last name if you want to. Gretchen is the vice president of CORD, um, the Coalition of the Rights oh, no. of the, no. Well, other Gretchen. Yeah, the Coalition of the Rights of the Disabled. So thank you for being on the call. And we also have Lisa Drennan and she is the owner of Merge and she does work around um, inclusion. Uh, so I just wanted to acknowledge them. And also Michael Messina is on the call and he is, um, uh, he ran, uh, he was running for state representative. Um, and also he had, was a past, um, you know, presenter on our show. So I just want to acknowledge uh, those folks that they are on the call and, and people feel free to type your questions into the chat box and we can read them off. And um, and I just wanna acknowledge Kelly, um, she tuned in late, but we read your, 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 your question to Chief Wack and he answered. So you'll be able to look at that in the tape portion of the show. So right now I wanna to go to our next panelist and her name is Mara Evans. And she is also a co-founder of the organization Sandwich Stands. And we had Jeannie, um, we had her explain what Sandwich Stands is. And we just want to give Mara the opportunity to speak to the new initiative um, that you're, you're going towards um, in the conversations so um, that you're having with people in the community. So Mara, if you wanna unmute yourself, then have a chance to introduce yourself, who you are and, and what you're doing. Thank you so much. I am honored to be part of this conversation and looking forward to more um, 
involvement moving forward. Um, as Jeannie stated, we were two people in a community that felt very strongly that we needed to take some action after um, seeing all of the unrest in our country. And thinking about affecting that change at a global level, a national level was a little daunting. Um, and so we, our conversation quickly led to, we live in this idyllic town. However, we are not addressing the issue of race. We are not a diverse community, but we still can support the efforts, we can learn and we can have conversations with people uh, to try to understand how we can better ourselves and how our community can be better in our interactions and in our policies. I think the biggest lesson that we continue to learn, and Jeannie, you can um, add here if you'd like, but Having these opportunities like you're offering Marie and like we um, were able to have yesterday where people can just have a forum to speak and be honest and share their experiences. I think Marie yesterday, um, you know, nobody can share your experience and say, this is what I did or this is what I think about what you experienced. That is your story to tell. And it is our responsibility to listen, to be empathetic, and then to act um, accordingly. And that is our goal, I think, for the community, that we are not so fast to um, judge, not so fast to take a side. And uh, he's done a lot of legwork with um, another organization called Braver Angels, who are working both on a state and national level to bring um, red and blue points of view together. So we were very fortunate to have the uh, Massachusetts representative, David Ball, um, be the moderator at a conversation yesterday with Marie and Chief Wack. And um, I'm very much looking forward to sharing that conversation and what that looked like, but, um, both Jeannie and I and some uh, the Sandwich Enterprise and Sandwich Community Television have been meeting around what are the issues that we wanna bring forward. We wanna model civil conversations and what does that look like? And yesterday I think was a great example of what a civil conversation looks like. Um, so we're looking forward, this is gonna be called Hear Me Out and we're waiting for some community feedback after it's aired. And we will uh, move forward with uh, hopefully some future topics uh, really focused on our community and how we can build from our own community to a bigger um, audience. Mm -hmm. Do you have um, a call to action? Do you have some speakers that you're looking for, um, sandwich residents? I know yesterday you talked about wanting to have a conversation with the faith community? Um, are there certain agencies that you're looking to connect with? If, if so, could you let us know now? Uh, we are going to be meeting again and uh, discussing as a group. So the Sandwich Enterprise, Sandwich Stands and uh, Sandwich Community Television will be meeting again as a group to um, see what our next steps are. And mm -hmm. I think we will move forward from there. There've been a couple of themes that have come out. Um, I think some of us had a little sidebar yesterday and talking about the faith community. Uh, Jeannie is doing some work with one of the local churches. Mm -hmm. um, Jeannie, I'll defer to you if you wanna talk about that for a minute. Uh, yeah, that's it's it's sort of a semi-related issue, um, and it's dealing specifically with post-election um, emotions. But in terms of this particular topic, um, you know, we really need and want 
community feedback before we decide what that next step is. You know, um, Kira, I'm listening to you and you can talk, talk circles around me when it comes to, to race. Like I, I, that's, I, I'm not an expert. I don't know what I don't know. Um, I teach communication. So I really do value creating a space in which people um, get, get the kind of experience that you had yesterday, right? Where you, you get to, to share, but you also get to listen. And I know, you know, my current reading is, is a book on empathy. It's across the way or I'd pick it up. Uh, you know, and it's it talks a lot about contact theory and this idea that um, through exposure, through interaction, through experience, that's how we de-escalate hate. We don't do it so much with policies. You know, there, there's this big police reform bill and, you know, not to, to get into a whole other topic, but I, I think about that and I think about what is the right step here and would that, and I don't know um, you, um, Peter, if you wanna talk about that, but would that end up making, creating you know, more compassion and more understanding and, and better relationships between our, our law enforcement community and our people of color? I don't know. I, I really am very excited about my current reading with this idea about um, empathy and, and contact theory and, and finding people who, who we can bring together to have those conversations and that community members can listen to in, in the same way that you've got this going on here. I'm really excited. Because you know that's, that's the way we change. That's the way we relate we empathize, it's, it's hard work to, to get past our biases, but that experience of empathy is, is a pretty powerful way to do it. Thank you. I'm seeing a lot of messages of hope that um, are coming in on the chat. You know, I think, um, let me see. So people are saying that they they have hope that um, that things will get better and things will change. Michael Masena wrote in, and also um, I see something from Lisa, Chief Wack. I have a, another question for you. Um, we saw on the news yesterday that Mayor Madi Walsh he had established a um, a task force for police reform, and um, I think he said that he was committed to doing um, some of the recommendations that they had, um, a commitment to a diversity and inclusion task force, um, a civilian police oversight office with, um, with the director and a, you know, a staff um, that had full investigatory and um, subpoena power. I was wondering what, what are your thoughts on that? And can you see something like that um, happening in the town of St. Rich? So it's a good question. So each community has its own dynamics. Um, and I know when we talked on the phone, the larger metropolitan areas uh, tend to have uh, issues that are much, much different than the small towns like the Cape Cod towns. Um, and so, and we talked about a little bit yesterday about Boston, and I didn't really have a lot of knowledge about Boston because I'm, I'm not familiar with them, but he may be dealing with a whole a dynamic situation which he needs to really wrap his hands around. One of the things, getting, uh, getting to your question, one of the things right after George Floyd's death that I felt was really important to get out to the community of Sandwich was um, what we're doing here in Sandwich is so much different than what was happening in Minneapolis or Baltimore or Detroit or anywhere else. Um, th those are large, large metropolitan areas. Uh, here in Sandwich, we really, we have focused, I've been here for just over 10 years, we focused on really being a professional operation. And what does that mean? We went from, and, and we talked about this, we went from three policies on the books for the entire police department when I got here to now we have well over 70 plus rules and regulations. And, these include bias-free policing standards, de-escalation of force training and standards, 
um, how we investigate complaints, citizen complaints, uh, how we take in citizen complaints, and regardless of what a union contract says, we take in anonymous complaints, third party complaints, um, non written complaints, we, we do everything. So I really wanted to be able to show to the community and in, in several of my writings and speakings that we are really working hard and we have been to be able to set the bar high here in Sandwich. And I really wanted people to feel comfortable to look at us and say, you know what, I feel safe in my community. I feel that if I have an issue with the police department, they're going to listen to me. And uh, they, they really want to represent the community as a whole. So as we're, as we're standing right now, I think we have a really good package in place as a police department working with our community and safeguarding everybody who lives, works, and travels through our town. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and you know, if someone wants to add to that, um, their thoughts on that, um, please uh, write something in the chat. Um, my thoughts um, on that is to, you know, one of the things that they're doing is a civil police oversight office with full investigators and subpoena powers. Yesterday, you talked about um, we police ourselves or, or you know, you have some oversight into your department, into your staff. Um, you know, when when things happen, we see, you know, the, um, you know, the police department backing the blue. You know, we've seen it, um, you know, from a, a woman of color, a mother at home watching this play out nationally or on TV. Um, my thoughts um, don't always go to, yeah, but, I know my police chief and this is a good town and I feel safe and I'm being served. It, it has a broader meaning to me. And um, you know, in times when things are good, it's okay. But when something goes wrong, um, the oversight, um, it, you know, I, I particularly like the civilian police oversight office with full investigatory and subpoena powers. I think, um, you know, I think it's necessary um, and welcome to have some oversight that doesn't just include the police department. Does that make any sense? Yeah, it does, it does. And I think, I think what we've seen over the years is um, there, there have been a lot of broken systems and that's where the United States Department of Justice comes in and sues a city or community and in essence ends up with a consent decree, which is basically a binding legal agreement where they bring in a, um, a professional civilian board. It may encompass lawyers or, or different folks. And it basically um, determines that the police agency needs radical change. Radical change because its policies are not in compliance with the Department of Justice. They're not serving their community fair and uh, fairly and equitably. And with that system in place, the US Department of Justice brings about serious, quick, fast change. And we've seen communities around the country which have needed this. Um, and usually they're, they're very large metropolitan areas. Um, and it, we, we saw it happen in Ferguson. I mean, that, that was just, uh, that was a, a community that, or law enforcement agency community that fell apart. It was policing for a profit. But you, you do need to look at it. Is it something that needs to be done unilaterally or is it something that we need to do piece by piece? And one of the things I talked about yesterday was as we're going through this uh, police reform process with our elected officials here in Massachusetts, one of the things that I've said to our elected folks is what is the benchmark that you feel that police agencies in Massachusetts should meet? What is the responsibility that they should be having for their community? Complaint intake, policies, training, uh, supervisor training is very critical. I think that's a piece that fell apart in Minneapolis. No supervisor showed up on that scene in a timely manner. And I know there's gotta be a lot of different rank working in Minneapolis 24 hours a day. Um, and what is that benchmark? And then look at each community, because if you meet or exceed that benchmark, you're, you're, you're doing what the elected officials want to be done. But if you're below that, you need to, you need to go through a, 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 
season of change. You need to bring about new policies. You need to show that you're going for accreditation. You need to show that you're listening to your community and doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, I know the Barnstable Police Department has what's called Unity Day in the spring and they have officers come out, lots and lots of food, lots of entertainment. Um, it's brought um, together by a group of um, young black males and they started it some years ago. And it brings the community together just to get to know each other and have fun. And I know I've brought my son Chase um, to that event uh, for at least three consecutive years. Um, and we make it a point to say hello to officers and um, try to build some relationships there. What kind of initiatives are you doing in Sandwich? Um, is there anything like that or any um, intent to bring something like that to your town? Well, first of all, um, I got to meet those gentlemen. Uh, some years ago, the Cape Cod Times had me on an editorial board um, panel and I uh, got to meet those fellows. They, uh, they do an amazing job bringing that together. Um, from my understanding, they brought it together, brought it to the police department and naturally the police department jumped right on. Um, we, we do a lot in our community and we're always open to do even more. I mean, one of the things I wanna give a little plug to is um, trunk or treat, trick or treating around the country is, is being you know basically stomped down and it, people don't want it uh, for whatever reason. Um, but here in Sandwich, um, one of the things, uh, and, and I'll get back on target in a second, but one of the things that really I liked about Trunk or Treat was we had a family with a special needs child who after we did it the very first time, um, the mom reached out to me emotionally and said, my child has never been able to trick or treat because of the disability. And you gave that opportunity. So what have we done? Trunk or treat can't exist under its normal way anymore. So we're doing what's called trunk or treat fly in town where we're setting up kind of a wooded area with cars and people are going to do it in their, their vehicles. And at the end, we're going to hand out a sanitized uh, candy bag to each child um, as they exit the, the property. So uh, we do that. We do uh, youth academies where we, um, we work with the schools and the administrators and finding at-risk children that need strong role models. We work with uh, women's safety. We do a women's safety program each year where we're teaching women about how to be safe at work and community at home. Uh, we have a citizen police academy we run. We, we started a program called Do the Right Thing in the Schools where when we find a young person who did something well, it started with a child that found a wallet and turned it in. Uh, we, we do a recognition program for those kids. We have a lot that we're involved in. We're teaching criminal justice in the high school and um, we, we really strive to do a lot. If somebody comes to us with a new idea, we jump in. We have an officer, Brian Bonderick, whose full-time job is community relations. And he is working so hard with mental health, with drug addiction right now. And we, we'd be pleased to join in if there was a new initiative that brought us together uh, as a community better. Thanks so much. And I, um, I know that Chief Wack has, um, a website for Sandwich, the town of Sandwich, and you can go on his website and read um, all about him, all about what's being done in the town, and all those different initiatives that he explained. I was really impressed reading about the one in the high school, where um, you know people who are interested in the um, the career of law enforcement can get in, you know, an education starting in high school. I was really impressed by that. So there's a lot going on, and sometimes. We don't know um, what's going on in our um, own communities, never mind the one next to us. Um, Susan writes, uh, su uh, what did you write? Um, the dis disabled, let me see, statistics show that black disabled are not always treated equally as whites. Have you ever heard about that study? Um, I, I just wanted to speak to that for a moment and, you know, I don't know if Chief, Chief Wack has heard about that, but I know having a son with Down syndrome and he um, just turned 16 years old, when he was about 14 years old, you know, you get this epiphany that, oh, they're getting older and they're growing up. And um, he had an incident where he left me and stopped and shop and, and ran away. And I needed to call the police. Um, long story short, he was found at 99. 
uh, you know, having um, a cheeseburger with the officers. Uh, 99 knows him well, and a, a lot of officers and people in town know Chase. And, you know, because I've used my platform to explain Chase and show his wonderful life. But one thing that came out of that for me in answer to um, Susan's response was that there's something that I can do and something that I needed to do. And I had spent um, a couple of years building relationships with Chase, with officers, first responders across Cape Cod, you know, from Provincetown to um, you know, just meeting people at different festivals and fairs, shaking hands, taking pictures, and um, and getting to know them as well as chief. So, I asked Kennedy Donovan, would they partner with me and bring together a police forum? We had um, officers from across Cape Cod and first responders come, and the this disabled community to have those conversations about the treatment of people with. Um, uh, with disabilities and also the response and the relationship. And it was really successful. And I hope to, um, uh, you know, together with Maureen and, and, and Nicole um, and, and Gretchen to, um, and, and Lisa to keep those conversations going and to bring together some more forums like that. So Chief Wack will be, you know, reaching out to you for um, those things. So, let me see. I just want to acknowledge Deborah Mitchell. She's um, from Natick. She says she's with Black Lives Matter Natick, and she'll be meeting with um, the police chief there. And they have a 1% Black population, um, a 3 to 5% Indian population. And they'll be talking with um, the, the police chief about diversity and um, policing. Kiara, I want to um, ask you a question about diversity. And I just wanted to ask your opinion on how you bring diversity into departments. And I know diversity could mean gender, it could mean disability, it could mean race, but in particularly in the area of race, how to bring diversity into a department such as Sandwich when um, the, the population in Sandwich of people of color is like 1%, you know, um, how, you know, how, how could a, how, how do you bring diversity into that situation? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think there's a couple of different, um, ways to think about that right so so diversity is about the numbers right diversity is and and I, I I've worked with more with um you know corporations organizations that maybe have a different kind of control over who they you know who they hire and so forth um and when I say that I mean you know from a training perspective like I think for the police force obviously people have to go apply go through the academy and so on and so forth but I think to bring diversity into the, the department, if, if you're looking for officers, you know, you have to create a pipeline for yourself, right? So you have to go out, you know, find the population that you want to encourage and talk to them when they're, when they're young. Like you, you have to start when people are young. I mean, you don't have to, but it's better. I think if you start, like, even when I'm talking to organizations, to corporations, you know, people like, oh, we can't find any people of color to hire. I'm like, well, that's, then you're not looking hard enough, <laughs> you know? So um, I think you look, you know, you look, look for people to, to talk to, to encourage, to have conversations um, from an administration perspective, administrative perspective, if you can hire people into your department without them going through, you know, basic training and so forth, then, you know, do that, like look for people to bring in, because what I, what I strongly believe, and I think, you know, I live on the South shore, so I'm not on the Cape, but, you know, not a hundred million miles away, the future of our, um, of our communities depends on being able to attract diverse people into the communities because the country is changing. The demographics in the country are changing. And if we are, you know, all white or pre predominantly white or um, neighborhoods, 
we're not going to be able to find the people that we want to work in our organizations. We we're, our, our, our communities are going to age out, essentially. And we need to be able to attract younger people to our communities, whether it's Sandwich, whether it's Barnstable, or whether it's Rockland, or whether it's Hingham. We need to be able to attract younger people to our communities to work and live. And I will tell you that millennials and Gen Z, racial equity is one of their top, if not their top priority from a uh, from a from a values perspective. It's what they care about. It's one of the things that they care about in, in a big way. So to diversify, yeah, you got You have to look for the people. Um, now, hiring people into your organization or into your um, department is great, but if you don't make them feel included and if people don't feel like they belong, they're not going to stay. And so what you want to have um, is as a policy of inclusion as well, and that's super important. I'm just looking at Gretchen's comment, a large portion of sandwich believes that being colorblind is the same as being not racist. That's obviously not true. <laughs> So I think we know that, right? I think pr probably everybody in this call knows that, but yeah, people say that, you know, I'm colorblind, I wasn't brought up to see color. And the problem with that is if you're not seeing color, then you're not seeing the history. You're not seeing the systemic, systemic racism. You're not gonna see the problems if you don't see that somebody is different from you and having a different lived experience. So I think that it's something that we work with when we're doing, um, you know, racial trainings and, and different, um, one of the one of the trainings I do a lot is around unconscious bias, and that helps to create um, open space for creating a more diverse workforce. So if you have creating awareness around people's unconscious biases, because we all have them, everybody has unconscious biases. There's a fascinating study test that you can do, or there's a series of tests that you can do. If you Google Harvard implicit bias testing, it's, it's fascinating. They have some amazing tests there um, that really kind of help to uncover our unconscious biases. And what's fascinating about unconscious bias is I can have in my heart the best of intentions and feel like I am like the least racist, the least sexist, the least whatever person in the world. And I can do that test and be shocked and surprised because my brain is not necessarily aligned with my heart and what, and what I want to believe about myself. So creating to, to, to create diversity, one has to first be open to creating a work, a diverse workforce. And I think to, in order to do that, we have to become aware of our unconscious biases and actively work to uh, work against them, like to work around them or work against, against is not the right word, but we have to work hard to make sure that we don't allow them to just continue to dictate what we do and how we behave. Thank you, Kiara. Marie, do you mind if I jump in here, Marie? Yes, I, I was going to give you the opportunity. I see you wrote in the chats that you wanted to ask Chief Wack a question. Yeah, thank you. And I also just want to respond to Kira's um, shout out for the Harvard.edu implicit bias test. I do that with my students, and it's it's very useful. Um, you know, what, our self-awareness often is only limited to what what we want to believe about ourselves. Right. And we can't change something we're not aware of. Correct, right. yeah. correct, yeah. Um, so if anybody's interested, it's I think implicit.harvard.edu. You have to know how to spell implicit. <laughs> um, we'll have that information for you. It's gonna be recorded as well, okay. Oh, great, great. So, so Chief, um, you know, it's wonderful to live in a town. It was wonderful to get your, your support. Uh, it was wonderful to, that you were available to, to sit with me when, when we, after we started doing our standing events. And, and I, you know, frankly grew a little concerned that some of the community reaction was, was more hostile than I was prepared for. Um, so, so I just wanna ask you, not, not to put you on the spot because I appreciate your leadership on this, but I did hear you say earlier that, that you've sort of done some self-examination and that you've made some recommendations and policies to the town administration. I wonder if you could talk more about that to us here. Um, yeah, and a, a quick plug for the book, Malcolm uh, Gladwell's book, Blink. I know Jeannie and I talked about it, but that, that talks about the same testing and uh, the studies as well. It's a good read. Um, so 
Jeannie, when I when I came into town, um, uh, I was brought in. I was brought in for structure, and uh, so what what we did was we started a uh, a new system of hiring. Not a new system of hiring. We're using an antiquated system, which is civil service, which I can talk about on another segment sometime. But um, we really started looking at the background of our people that were hiring, and we hire uh, specifically sandwich residents, and we go through our entire list every year. Um, we, we look at everybody, but I looked at it and I said, listen, we need to, we need to start doing more training. Um, and we need to have policy dealing with all sorts of aspects of policing and bias free policing, which is not required by accreditation was a policy I felt strongly about from my background in the Connecticut state police. We, we have a strong form of actions uh, program. And I felt that we needed to bring that into sandwich as well. It also, we built on it with supervisor training. And I talked about in Minneapolis, um, what happened with, with George Floyd and supervisors need to be trained from day one. So even before supervisors promoted, when I see them on a list, I send them off to Roger Williams College to get trained uh, in leadership and how to be a supervisor. And then I send them off to internal affairs training. I want them to understand, uh, one of the things Marie knows about me is my background, I commanded uh, internal affairs twice for the state police and I was an investigator with them and I learned a lot about what needs to be done to uh, to to have good integrity in a police department and so I want all my supervisors to have that training and then my managers I want to make sure they they have the training but I know our time is running short but I also a long time ago I started reading consent decrees. Um, before I came here to Sandwich, I started reading them. I started, I wanted to develop policy and procedure in Sandwich based on what the US Department of Justice is finding wrong with broken departments. So when we build our new police department, we have an entire room dedicated to a, 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 a situational simulator, which teaches our officers not only escalation of force, but seriously de-escalation of force. What happens when a person drops their gun? What happens when a person is complying with your directives and your, and your uh, tasers out or your nightsticks out or your guns out? How do you de-escalate? How do you communicate? These scenarios change. So I, I've really tried to work on a lot of different aspects of that um, to bring us to a different level than other police departments locally or nationally. I think you're muted. Marie, we can't hear you. You're muted. Okay. I muted myself. My wonderful son Chase just walked in and I needed to mute myself. So um, Jeannie, did he answer your question? Yeah, I just wanted to just say that I appreciate you, um, Peter, and um, all that you have shared with us. Um, it makes such a difference, a world of difference to um, reach out to get to know someone in their perspective and what is actually happening. Um, not what we perceive to be happening or, you know, but what is actually happening in the town and um, all the good policies and initiatives that you have put into the place um, in Sandwich and you can be a model for other um, police departments across Cape, uh, Cape Cod. I know you guys uh, must talk or, you know, work together. I saw that you were the, um, are you the president of the Police Chief Association or something like that? I'm, I'm the president of the Law Enforcement Council, which is all of Barnstable County and Nantucket Police Chiefs, the District Attorney, State Police Sheriff's Office, um, environmental police, it's its all the law enforcement entities here on Cape Cod. Great. So we are um, past the five o'clock hour. We do have a few more minutes to wrap up, but I just want to just say that I truly appreciate the participation of our panelists today, Mara and Jeannie. I just applaud you for your work that you've done and are doing in the town of Sandwich um, with Sandwich Stands and your new initiative um, where you're bringing people together to have open uh, candid conversations. I applaud you for um, taking a stand even when you did not really truly understand the outcomes or the risks that you would be taking um, to yourselves, um, to your reputation uh, in your community. So 
um, that takes bravery. And we need more of that, more of that kind of coverage that stands up and, and stands up for what they believe in. Um, I'd like to thank you, Kiara, for all of your, uh, your knowledge. And we hope to reach out to you um, again for um, your, your, your knowledge and um, some of your trainings. Um, again, I'd like to thank our sponsors, um, Kennedy Donovan and the Department um, of Social uh, Services and also Social Techie. I'd like to thank you for all your help in um, producing this show and all of you who join us week after week to have these conversations that matter. And I hope that um, you can, can we, these things can continue. If you can recommend um, people that you would like to see on the show um, in terms of um, being panelists, please send me a note. I'd like to uh, share a resource with you all. I don't know if anyone had the opportunity to watch Driving While Black last night. Anybody? It was on PBS. And it was a really good um, documentary. And it took us through slavery, the civil rights movement, Jim Crow and current day as a black person and in transportation and how um, we, got on, um, we got around and how um, it shaped us in our communities and the challenges that we face simply by traveling across America. It was outstanding, very, very eye-opening. So I would encourage you guys to, to find that. It's called Driving While Black. So again, I'd like to thank everyone for coming on today and sharing with us. And you can look for the tape shortly. We'll get that up um, so that you can look at it. Is there anything else, anything um, else that anyone would like to add on our panel? before we close out for today. Marie, this is Jeannie, and I'll just um, make a request that if any of your audience members uh, would like to, particularly people of color who are part of the audience, um, would like to reach out to us at Sandwich Stands to help inform us going forward, I we would really welcome that. Wonderful. So it's it's sandwich stands at Gmail. Sandwich stands at Gmail. And they also have a Facebook page if you want to look at um, some of what they've been doing and um, articles that were written about them or what have you. It's funny today because our audience is normally predominantly Black. And, you know, we've been, um, it, it's always very diverse, but there, there has been. Um, several black folks on um, the call that lent to the conversation and um, not today. So I don't know what that's about, but um, I'll just take it as it's not a convenient time today. But I think this was a wonderful conversation, just a snapshot of just one town on Cape Cod and um, their there's more to come. So thank you all for joining us today. Thank you to our sponsors. And we hope that you will join us again in two weeks for another edition of Conversations That Matter. I'm Marie Younger Blackburn, your host and moderator, signing out. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.